SmackDown have had their two shows this week. And yes, they both were of pretty good quality. It's time now to go through the important segments that both had and see which one managed to topple the other. Yes, this counts as a wrestling round episode if those of you are counting at home, which means at the end, I will be able to update the ratings thusly. We kick things off with Raw and Roman Reigns' promo with Samoa Joe's return being featured. Now, of course, Roman came through and obviously highlighted that, yes, he didn't find out about his match at the Greatest Saudi Arabian Raw Rumble event until he found out on the internet. That's not how you build sympathy, and the crowd ate him alive. The reasoning behind keeping Lesnar on is to make sure that Roman wins that title in front of a crowd that will actually cheer him. Lord knows we have no idea how Roman will be perceived by a crowd in another country that isn't the UK or the US. I look forward to seeing how that goes down. But the one thing that made this promo utterly amazing was Samoa Joe himself, who delivered another consummate, incredible and fantastic fantastic performance. My breath has been taken away by how amazing Samoa Joe is. That isn't just because I'm thirsty. Here's the thing. Samoa Joe outlined so much awesome truth that even our truth himself would have enjoyed being part of it. Too bad he wasn't. Well, actually, good thing he wasn't. You would probably expect that. Samoa Joe came out and told the truth as it was, that Roman Reigns was an absolute failure and that he basically pinned the entire hopes of the entire locker room on himself, only to be crushed by the weight of it. And, of course, that, well, he's a massive liar for promising to do all he could but never actually did and got beaten by a man who should honestly have left WWE by now with his tail and sack of money tucked between his legs. And on top of that, after the Great Society, Arabian event after both men tear each other apart and beat themselves senseless, that Samoa Joe will be the first in line to pick up the pieces and hopefully the championship. I've forgotten how good Samoa Joe is on the mic, even though I'm constantly reminded he's probably the best promo cutter on the whole bloody roster from top to bottom. Now, I just wished he was at WrestleMania because he would have given John Cena a hiding and it would have been amazing. Instead, Undertaker got that job. Still fun, but either way, good to have you back, Samoa Joe. We can't really say much more than that. Then we had Kurt Angle, Sami Zayn, and Kevin Owens' infamous backstage segment. Now, of course, the match that they had to win a contract on Raw for a double count out was as good as you would think it would be. It's Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. The match result was predicted by me from the moment the match began. And as you can probably tell, I was 100% right, meaning we have no idea what the hell these two are going to do in the next few weeks. Adds a lot of intrigue. In the case of this promo segment, it was pretty funny, but there was one moment, of course, to set it above everything else. The Kurt Angle said, Our tag team division's full, but I heard TNA is hiring. Now, here's the thing. On the TV version of this, you can hear the audible, oh, huge gasping reaction and shock. In person, it was frankly a million times louder than that. We had to take our faces off the floor quite a while afterwards because we could not believe that Angle just mentioned TNA on air. Now, of course, they're no longer called TNA, which is why they can actually say that on the air and get away with it without being sued for potential defamation and other things. But here's the thing. That's how you make the crowd go completely batshit without actually doing anything. I can give Kurt Angle some props because he always knows when to drop an absolute bombshell. And that is a good thing, ladies and gentlemen, if I can say that. The roar itself kicked off on the night with Stephanie getting her arm broken by Ronda Rousey after waxing lyrical about he, about he, about how she managed to save and prove that the women's division is now better than ever and that she's given Ronda her best ever performance in a ring of any kind and that she is the one reason to be thankful for. Ah. Oh. Even after losing and being embarrassed in front of 75-ish thousand people, she still comes out being an absolute C-word. And yes, I am censoring myself because I know some people may not want to hear that word on my show. Well, to be honest, that was more an editorial decision than a decision to please all of you. Because I think you'd all want to hear me call her an absolute <laughs> Yeah. That's all I can say on that. However, seeing Ronda do basically what she did at WrestleMania, breaking that arm, but also having Stephanie being taken out on a stretcher almost, 
and then being told by Jojo for the crowd to please respect her was the icing on the cake. This feud isn't over, but at least Ronda did what she's capable of and what she knows how to do, which is to act menacing and cause a lot of damage. Her mic work still needs some improvement, but at least I know she could do this and keep the crowd on her side. The crowd are going to be much more receptive of her after her WrestleMania performance, but going forward, I just want to see her kick the crap out of people. She goes from a smiling, lovable person into an absolute badass at a snap of a finger. And you can't go wrong with that. Then we had Elias do a usual segment, which, okay, I will admit, when I first started doing wrestling rounds at the beginning of the year, again, that uh, I wasn't a huge fan of Elias' musical numbers. <laughs> They're now fantastic to me, and I find them hilarious. More or less, I gave them a chance and just stopped focusing on his singing for a minute. It's the lyrics that count, people. Oh boy, and the build-up is always good, so I can't deny that. And, well, we all got on his side, we loved Elias, and we wanted to walk with him, but of course he then called us scumbags, we then called ourselves scumbags, because we're, we're a WrestleMania crowd, still reeling from last night, we're gonna be really, really high on things. He then did his song, and then Bobby Lashley turned up. Oh yeah. And as you can see, Rico is behind me, he freaked the hell out. Not because, holy crap, it was a moment that we probably should or shouldn't have seen coming, but he did see it coming. He predicted it the night or two before, so applause given to the man sitting behind me. On top of that though, Lashley looked imperious and domineering as you would expect. However, the standing stalling suplex as his new finisher I would rather see a Dominator because that's much more imposing in the glorious, glorious statement of power. That being said, if you're able to hold Elias up for nearly a minute and not lose consciousness yourself or get tired, I'll take that. No way, Jose. Speaking of no way, Jose, um, yeah, his in-ring debut was interesting. It was a squash match. I would have rather given Bobby Lashley the squash match on that front because it would have looked a lot more fun. Here's the thing. No way Jose, a good wrestler by all means, and what I found out recently, he has a 75% win percentage across his entire career, despite the fact he was painted as a perennial loser in parts of NXT. That doesn't make any sense. But the gimmick itself, him doing conga lines with people around the ring, reminiscent of Adam Rose, is going to grow tired fast unless he finds creative ways to do it. That being said, he got the victory. Everyone had a good time except for me because that song gets in my head and I hate it so much. But that's all I can do with that. I really can't push Adobe's button on changing a song that's already been established for over two or three years on another brand. I just hope, I wish No Way Jose the best. I just don't think his gimmick will do well. And overall, the segment just felt a bit lacklustre, and if I was rating this on the Wrestling Rant stagnant notion of old, I would give this a strike. <laughs> yeah, if this was on my usual Wrestling Rant area, I would give this the first X of the evening, because that was the first and probably only segment on this show that I really found annoying or irritating. That's mostly because No Way Jose's theme song is irritating, and he wasn't given the chance to showcase himself in a way we all believe he could. That's wasted potential as far as I'm concerned, and we move on to something all the while different. Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt as a tag team. They beat Titus Worldwide, but the match itself, while not the most interesting athletic contest, had a lot of good things going for it. Oh yes it did. We had Bray Wyatt <laughs> responding nicely to things in time with Matt, and on top of that, the wonderful for, for Apollo's athletic acrobatics. Got the crowd applauding, got the heels applauding, got the faces applauding. It was all crazy. And the delete worldwide was one of the funniest things I've seen in a WWE ring for many, many years. Because holy crap, the crowd ate it up like you wouldn't believe. And they looked like a solid tag team of decent chemistry. Did the Woken One and the Eater of Worlds. Or the Eater of Woken Worlds. I don't know what kind of tag name they're going to come up with. And they idolised the Andre the Giant Memorial Trophy before they came out there. Fantastic! Also, Bray has given Matt the ability to teleport, which is equally fantastic and scary in its own right. They're going to go forward to a tag team tournament final against the Revival, who beat Gallows and Anderson, to face the bar at 
the uh, Greatest Royal Rumble event in Saudi Arabia for the Tag Team Championships. That could be interesting. It could be a dumpster fire. We don't know at this point, but it would mean, inevitably, that if Cesaro and Sheamus do face off against Bray and Matt, it is going to be a very fun match come April 27th. Then we go on to Strowman himself, because why is this Tag Team Championship tournament happening? He relinquished the Tag Team titles. Nicholas is in the fourth grade. He had to go back to school. And, well, Strowman took it like a boss and made us laugh our asses off in the process because he just knew what was going to happen. On top of that, Nicholas did the get these hands thing, and Strowman highlighted that when he finishes school and he's old enough, we're going to win those Tag Team Championships back. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen, really. That being said, though, Nicholas, you're going to have a lot of friends for the next, what, five, six years of your life? And when spring break comes around in about six years' time, you are going to get all kinds of action. That being said, why the hell am I commenting on the potential sexual activity of a minor? That sounds wrong in almost every context. Let's focus on Strowman, because what the hell are they going to do with him now? Are they going to stick him on SmackDown during the Superstar Shake-Up, which I must remind you is coming next week? They announced that as well. Potentially that's a good thing. He needs to go on to SmackDown to be anywhere near a title picture. But I'm not entirely sure. Maybe they want to leave Roman Reigns as a champion to be unseated by a man who he literally can only beat at the barest minimum on Raw for the last year. Who knows? All I'm saying... Strowman did it for a stunt to get in the championships, then he knew what he had to do, and he's now free to basically do whatever the hell he wants to do. Perfect. And well, to end this on a note which will seek very well into SmackDown, Mandy Rhodes and Sasha Banks had a match that was uninspiring outside of the Bailey accidental interference, which cost Sasha the match perfectly fine with that. It builds the story, but I'm just hoping for the heel turn to happen on the actual show. And then we had Paige delivering her in-ring retirement speech. Now, as a person from around Ipswich or Colchester way, about 40, 50 miles south of Norwich, where she's from, I felt a crushing sense of sadness and unbelievable disappointment, but at the same time, it was understandable and 100% very much notable. Given the fact we knew her medical reports weren't looking that great, she was going to retire at some point. She did it where she won the title four years ago, which of course I was also present for. And as a result, well done Paige. Thank you for all you've given us over the last few years. You definitely deserved the applause and adulation. And yes, forever, the Smoothie King Center will always be your house. Speaking of what will also be your house, Smackdown Live, a show that for the last few weeks has been killing it on weekly television. It got off to a massive bang this time, as Paige was announced as the new GM in the wake of Daniel Bryan's resignation. Also, Shane, where was your leave of absence, sir? Because you shouldn't have been there, that's just my opinion. But here's the thing. Paige came out, was enthusiastic and happy that Shane gave her this opportunity, and it's going to be very, very interesting to see how she acts around all the wrestlers going forward, because it should be a lot of fun. And she also announced AJ Styles versus Daniel Bryan in this night. Oh yeah, this is going to be good. And in fact, I might as well go on to that match, because it was good. Oh man, these guys put on a fast-paced, momentum-shifting, technical wrestling contest that was so, so fun. They could have saved it for a pay-per-view, but I'm kind of happy they didn't, as I got to see this dream match in the flesh. It was lovely. But of course, all good things come to an end unceremoniously, as the heel Shinsuke Nakamura came in, knocked Brian out of the ring with a knee to the head, and of course then decided to low blow Styles twice, nearly turning his testicles into ovaries in the process, and he then hit him with a Kinshasa to end the show on a massive note understandable. However, that wasn't Nakamura's first appearance on the show, however. He was interviewed by Renee Young in what was arguably one of the funniest things I saw all weekend, highlighting to Renee when asked about why he ended up low-blowing AJ and turning on him, using the old stereotypical racist line that technically isn't in his, ha his Japanese hands. Sorry, Mio speak English, which got the 
the crowd and the audience at home laughing their arse off because this charismatic arsehole, this charismatic bastard who we all know can do this with so much whimsy, charm and insincerity that it comes off as condescending, yet we all loved it regardless. Shinsuke Nakamura as a heel could be one of the most entertaining things SmackDown has. I am hoping they keep him in the Superstar Shake Up because it's going to be well worth it. God, that segment was great. And the thing is, even when he came out later, he still got booze. Well done, Shinsuke. Well done indeed. You got us all laughing, yet you still came as hated as you could have been. Good stuff. Then we had something that I felt was a bit irritating. We had two matches, one for the Tag Team Championship number one contendership and one for the US Championship number one contendership. Both matches were great. Not going to be around the bush here. Both were very enjoyable, tense and fantastically good athletic contests. But here's the problem. The Usos and Randy both won after they lost their titles two nights ago. Where was the rematch clause? Just saying, because it's something that you'd often hear about, especially as you heard about it from Miz. Speaking of which, I didn't even mention anything about the Miz on Raw. Well done, sir. Your matches with Finn Balor, the Miz Taraj, and Jeff Hardy's return, of course, were also great. I just felt that everything else was a little more newsworthy over time. That being said, I got to see Jeff Hardy in the flesh. Friend of mine isn't going to be happy about that. Anyway, back to SmackDown at hand here. Why were these guys not been doing their job and actually doing a rematch clause? Then again, the matches were great on itself. It entertained me immensely. So inevitably, I can't criticize it too much. It was a technicality that I'm picking on, and it's not really much that I can say. And then we get to Naomi versus Natalia, the only strike-worthy thing of the night, fighting over that trophy and just... Not being the most entertaining of matches, despite the fact that Naomi had the crowd in the palm of her bloody hands. That being said, Naomi, you better stay on SmackDown. I wouldn't mind Natalia going to the other side, because it would give me another reason to not watch Raw over the course of the week. Ha <laughs> ha. Ah, but of course, you guys are waiting for me to get to the most important part of SmackDown. Charlotte's promo, which was good in its own right, can't deny that. She's a good promo cutter, putting that intense energy behind it. Peyton and Royce of NXT fame debuted. They then beat Charlotte up, leading to Carmella cashing in the Money in the Bank and winning the SmackDown Women's Championship. Sure, the cash in took longer than it needed to, and the celebration did as well, but it was so fun. We saw it coming from a mile off, but that didn't stop our enthusiasm from top to freaking bottom. SmackDown had a lot of shocking moments, but not in the same way that Raw did, and as you can see here, a title change was very much noted. And my god, was it worth waiting for. Carmella spent over 286 days as the holder of the briefcase, and waited for the best time to do it. And of course, I know people are saying, wait, they sacrificed Asuka's undefeated streak for this? Well, at least it happened in a ridiculously good 4 plus star technical contest rather than being hit in the face by a briefcase or a stiff kick following said match and her victory. She could be in line next, we don't know what's happening with her, the Superstar Shake Up will confirm other things. So, at the end of all that ladies and gentlemen, where do I rank these shows individually? <coughs> Sorry about that, I have no water in this hotel, my throat is killing me. So here's the thing, Raw had one or two things that were not that spectacular. The Tag Team Eliminator wasn't too bad, and of course I forgot to completely mention the Authors of Pain debuting, but they ditched Paul Ellering. So... The match wasn't anything special though, that's why I completely forgot to mention it. The debut was something, but the match wasn't. And that's the thing with Raw. The matches didn't have much importance, and they were just there to carry something over into next week that really doesn't matter because at the end of the day the greatest Royal Rumble event in Saudi Arabia is it really worth building up to? I don't really know it's not an event that I'm really intrigued by because it's not really a pay-per-view Raw spent a lot of time building up to that and debuting and returning people whilst Smackdown entertained us immensely with core matches with their actual talent and only one debut whilst, well, Paige came through as GM which surprised everybody because no one saw it coming and of course we got a new champion out of it and segments that were all useful. I mean, 
it's difficult to say because both shows were good this week, but SmackDown was great. So as you can tell, but counting the last few weeks of non-recorded Wrestling Night episode scores into account, as you can see, SmackDown closed the gap. Oh yeah, a few weeks back, SmackDown only had, what, one or two wins to its name, while Raw was running away with it with eight or so. Now, Raw and SmackDown, oh yeah, they are almost tied. So with the Superstar Shake-Up being next week's two editions, it's going to be interesting to see how those new additions to the rosters can actually benefit their shows and how they're presented. I mean, I'm wearing a bar t-shirt for God's sake. I am hoping they end up on SmackDown, which means they won't be winning the Tag Team Championships at the Greatest Royal Rumble event in Saudi Arabia. And just in case you wanted to know, yes, I am going to be analyzing that show in its entirety for Wrestling Rant when I return. It should all be great. So at the end of the day, SmackDown nearly has tied up the rankings at 8 to 7. Let's hope next week they can continue that so the remarkable comeback of the blue brand can be solidified into stone. And if you do not want to miss next week's wrestling rant, which I believe will be happening on a Thursday, a change to the schedule that was outlined, you can get all of that in your sub feed by clicking that subscribe button down there and ensuring you click on the bell icon so you get the notification of when it arrives. And of course, if you do want to please me even more, a cheeky like would not go amiss either way. Now, with that in mind, WrestleMania week is over. Me and Rico have enjoyed ourselves immensely. It's been a fun, fun time. The events themselves have been utterly, utterly fantastic to witness live in person. And that being said, I now need to rest up because I am ready to prepare for a very long flight back to the UK. And I will see you all next week when Pones and Stuff, Wrestling Rant, and of course a Friday flashback all come out within the same bloody period. And it should be fun. Fun with a capital PH. Because there's nothing more than highlighting the degradating nature of the water round here than with that joke. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. I had to buy tons of bottled water because this place, ugh, American water, is not the best tasting in the world. And on that observation, thank you New Orleans for a fantastic, fantastic time. I hope we see each other again. I have been Freddie Thomas, you have been people watching, this has been the Raw and Smackdown After Mania Reactions video for the CC Network. And well, I will see you all next time.